Welcome to our video interview on IFRS 9. I'm Tapiwa from W Consulting, and we're extremely pleased to have Daryl Scott, a member of the ISB, who will be speaking to us today about uh, IFRS 9 and um, the exciting and long journey to its final completion in May 2014. So I hope you find this informative and enjoyable. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Tapiwa. So Daryl, if we can just take it right back to the beginning. Why did we need a project to replace I-39? What were the key drivers behind uh, a need for us to reassess the accounting for financial instruments? The really big issue with I-39, which is the predecessor document, was it was overly complex. It wasn't a principle-based standard. It was more of a rules-based standard. Um, that got found out during the financial crisis in 2008, where effectively what happened is the rules process that underwrote IS39 broke down to an extent in the face of the crisis. The ISB made some emergency changes to the standard at the time to try to fix some of the issues, for example, on reclassifications. But the reality was that brought to the attention of the ISB the fact that this was a standard which worked most of the time, but didn't actually work under pressure. I think also the ISB had always planned that the um, financial instruments was a topic that they would revisit. But the financial crisis certainly drove the timing. I suppose the global nature of that crisis made it imperative that the project be a, a joint project between yourselves and the, the FASB, your US counterparts. You've gone through that process together now. We've got a standard. Is it a joint standard or are there areas of difference between yourselves and the FASB? The two boards worked together for a long period on this particular project and the intent at the outset was that we would achieve a joint project. Um, in reality what happened is that we found that the starting point for the two boards was very different. The ISB has got a fairly long track record of having uh, principle based standards and we felt that it was particularly important in, in, in the circumstance of financial instruments to go the principle route. Uh, FASB found that a lot more difficult. The historical basis for setting standards has been a rules-based approach and they're able to do that to a certain extent because of the enforcement processes they have which stand behind their standards. Um, as we worked through the process we found on each of the topics we picked up that this rules-based versus principle-based issue became an important uh, factor in the discussions we were having and so in the end there are similarities between the two sets of standards and it's worth saying that the FASB hasn't yet completed their process but there are similarities in the process to date, but those similarities are very much at, the, at a high level. Once you get into the depth, they are two relatively different approaches. Where does that leave financial reporters that are you know, multi-located? Uh, you know, where does that leave them for their financial reporting? I guess in the past decade, we've been on this road towards convergence and, uh, and clearly the, the pressure and the expectation from the preparer environment, analyst environment, invest environment is to have converged reporting. Uh, possibly this is a disappointing outcome, but where does that actually leave us in general around the idea of convergence uh, around key projects in particular? And, and I think I'll pick up one, one sentence from you. This is a disappointing outcome, and we from the ISB perspective, and I suspect from the FASB perspective as well, are disappointed that we couldn't achieve convergence. Um, it leaves us with a difference on one of the fundamental standards. Financial instruments is a fundamental standard in our body of standards. But importantly, I guess, um, for uh, the primary users of financial instruments are the banks and the other financial institutions. So at least it applies to a fairly limited subset. What you're going to find, I suspect, is for those who actually have to play in both markets, they will have to produce some numbers for both markets in order to allow the markets to understand their different points. Um, it became an issue particularly when we were discussing the hedging standard and the impairment standard. And in both of those, we were very direct with our constituents. We told them what the FASB option was. We told them what our view was of the same issue. And we asked them what they felt was more important, convergence, or what we from the ISB perspective believe was the correct answer. And we were generally very comforted to get uh, the feedback that people felt that getting the right answer was perhaps more appropriate for them then having a converged answer. There are a limited number of players in the banking and financial institution space who actually are in the US market and the IFRS market. And for those, they will have to make a decision and that may well require them to actually keep records in both sets. Um, it's also worth perhaps taking a step back. The underlying standards are quite different, but in many cases, the outcome is gonna be very, very similar, if not identical. And I think that will also play into the way people perceive the differences between the two sets of standards. Right. So returning to the standard itself, you adopted a fairly unique approach 
relative to other projects where you released portions of the new standard at different times. I think the first portion was 2009, measurement and classification, and then uh, uh, subsequent uh, releases thereafter. Is that an approach that was, in hindsight, was it a successful approach? What was the intended purpose of that approach? And is that something that we can look forward to in other complex projects? Uh, so leases comes to mind potentially as, a, as an example of a, a relatively complex project that, that might use a similar approach. So I mentioned earlier that one of the key reasons why we tackled this project um, was the financial crisis and, and was driven by some considerations that came out of the financial crisis. Because of that, the board felt it was really important that we make um, these changes available to companies as soon as possible, given that some of the criticisms that arose from the financial crisis was that the standard that we had was not responsive enough. So the intent with the multiple phased approach was to try and allow companies to adopt as and when the board finished a particular part, part of the project, rather than waiting for everything to be completed. Um, it's difficult to answer the question on whether it was successful. I think what we've seen is that we've had a lot more buy into the process because it's been released in stages. So people have had the opportunity to pick up and understand a particular stage and then adopt it on that basis, uh, not adopt it, understand it on that basis and use that as a basis to build their views on the rest of the project. So from a feedback perspective, certainly it's been successful. In terms of adoption, which is the sort of feet on the ground, it's the real test, there's been very little early adoption of the standard. And I think that in itself says something. Primarily that was about companies looking at the issue and saying, well, okay, we're relatively comfortable that the issues that existed at the financial crisis are not in existence right now. We don't need those solutions at this point in the economic cycle. And at the same time, we would prefer to wait and understand what the whole package looks like. And so generally speaking, companies across the, the globe seem to have actually waited and held back. In terms of whether we've used this for another standard, I think the circumstances were very specific. It was financial crisis, it was the urgency that was perceived in getting a solution on the ground. And I don't think that's really relevant to any of the other standards we're working on at the moment. Turning to the standard itself, um, and, and I suppose we can also look at it in the same way that, that uh, the project was run. So let's start off with classification and measurement. So, because we've been speaking about it since 2009, etc., so everyone kind of knows the highlights. And the highlights are we've reduced the complexity in terms of the number of categories. And effectively, we now have just two categories being amortized cost and fair value. Now, of course, I know that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Can you just take us through the approach that the new standard has towards classification and measurement uh, and, and, and perhaps some of the thinking behind the new approach? Okay. I think, I think the approach that we've taken in IFRS 9 is the business model approach. The business model approach essentially says look to your underlying business rationale, look to the way you manage the business, the way you think about the business, the way you measure the performance of the business, and use that as the primary indicator for how you decide on how to classify something. And that, that talks to maybe an overall conceptual reason. Um, IFRS has different measurement bases in them, for in it, fair value, fair value OCI and, and amortized cost. And obviously those different measurement bases create some complexity in our standards. So we have to think about why we accept that they should be there. And the reason we accept that they should be there is that we believe that different methods of managing a business change the nature of the cash flows you expect to receive from that business. If you're buying and selling things on a continuous basis, the cash flows you expect to receive come from the buy and sell action. And fair value is an appropriate measure in that circumstance. If, on the other hand, you simply hold an asset to use in your own business or to collect the cash flows that come from it, then the nature of the cash flows you'll receive, the nature of the predictive uh, element of the asset value, is in the cash flows you're expecting, those flow of cash flows over life. And amortized cost is perhaps the best representative of how that value is determined, what that value means. So what IFRS 9 tries to do is it tries to capture that information. It tries to capture the fact that there are business models in different organizations. There is an override. We believe that there are some circumstances when the nature of an instrument is so complicated that amortized cost doesn't produce a reasonable value. Now the most obvious circumstance for that is derivatives. A derivative instrument is all about its changes in value and therefore we think even if your intent was to hold to collect, the nature of the instrument is such that you should be reflecting it at fair value because that more accurately reflects your cash flows. And so we built in a business model test and then on top of the, build the business model test, or next to it if you like, is a test which says what are the contractual, what is the contractual nature of this contract? 
what we call the PNI or the principal and interest test. And that's simply an override to see whether or not amortized cost does provide reasonable information. So in terms of this, if you think about the way that you go about doing the classification, so we start off with the business model, we understand the context within which the financial instruments arise and the context within which they're managed. How does that approach affect the approach towards reclassification? And the IS39 was notoriously difficult and uh, very roles oriented, quite restrictive. So how does this new approach for classification affect reclassification? That's a very good question because that's fundamental to one of the concerns that have been raised around the original IS39 model. So IS39 was pretty much a rule-bound approach for getting into the classification approach. Because it was a rule-bound approach, you needed rule-bound approaches for changing. And there was a genuine underlying concern that suggested under 39 that changes might happen for purposes other than reflecting what was really happening. In other words, to achieve or arbitrage profit or purporting issues. Because IFRS 9 talks about the business model, and because the business model is then a fundamental, is your business model to collect cash flows, or is your business model to actually trade in that particular instrument? That's a reflection of a real fact. So classification is based on an underlying test of facts and circumstances. And facts and circumstances can change. So IFRS 9 comes along and says, well, under certain circumstances, and we do accept and, and state very clearly this could be rare, but under certain circumstances, those facts and circumstances may change. And if that is the case, you're obliged to change your, your reporting model, your classification. The logic behind that is simply that you want, from our perspective, a consistent classification and measurement based on the underlying business model. If the business model is different, if you don't actually have that change, you'll have an inconsistency in the way you classify and measure Turning to financial liabilities, I suppose a lot of what we've spoken to uh, up until now has affected primarily financial assets. So let's talk a little bit about financial liabilities. There seems to be very little change compared to I-39, uh, which is possibly ex expected. But we do have a particular change relating to the accounting on changes to fair value of financial liabilities arising from changes in the issuer's own credit risk. Can you explain the logic behind that and, and some of the reasons behind why the accounting for that has changed? Sure. It's one of those oddities of the financial markets and it's one that from an economic perspective makes absolute sense. If my company is performing well, my credit is rated higher, therefore the price of my credit is, rated, is higher. If my company is performing poorly, my credit is rated badly and the price of my credit drops. That's all fine and makes a lot of sense when you're looking at this credit from the perspective of an asset, but it produces an odd effect when you're looking at it from the perspective of a liability. It means that if my credit is loaded on my balance sheet at a particular value and I then perform badly, that value drops. Drop means that I now have a lower liability on my balance sheet and I've made a profit. And many looking at this felt that although they understood the economics, although they were comfortable with the economics, the profit and loss effect was counterintuitive. It would appear that a company doing badly would make a profit, a company doing well would make a loss. It seemed counterintuitive, people were very uncomfortable with the way it worked. We heard that through IS39, it continued into IFRS 9, it was a significant factor during the financial crisis, where as banks' ability to service their debt fell, their value of their debt fell and they recorded a profit, even though they had no actual ability of ever realizing that profit. Um, again, say we're comfortable with the economics and so we're comfortable that that value that we record the liability on the balance sheet is correct. We just share the concern people had about the effect it has an in income statement. And so in essence, all we've done is said that you need to strip out that effect of changes in own credit. And instead of recording it in profit and loss, you record it in OCI. Right, so if we then wrap all that up in terms of measurement and classification, as a general expectation, if you were to consider the types of businesses that are out there using IFRS, is your sense that the typical business is going to experience a change in the classification of their financial assets and liabilities with a bias more towards amortized cost or more towards uh, you know, fair value? Or do you expect things to remain more or less the same, but perhaps the reasons behind the outcome are different? I think, I think it talks a little bit to what you think is a typical business. Um, so certainly I think some businesses are going to fa experience fairly significant change. 
Um, in the South African context, there are one or two banks that have used fair value quite extensively in the past, and one or two banks have been less inclined to use it. What this should do is level the playing field to an extent, because it now puts everything else aside and says, look to your business model. And when you look at the underlying business models of those banks, they actually run the same type of business. They have a very similar principle of looking at things. So I think what you'll see in those circumstances is a evening of the playing field, if you like, a more comparable outcome. If your typical, balance, if your typical business is a non-financial business, I think the outcome might be very different. Non-financial businesses with financial assets and liabilities on their balance sheets tend to have quite different objectives. They tend to manage them in quite different ways. And I think that will now start to come through. And you'll see that some of the balance sheets that I've looked at in the South African context, and I'm now talking about industrial companies with big investments, are going to have quite significant changes. Because the rationale for why they hold the investments is very different to perhaps a hole to collect for cash flows or something along those lines. So I suspect we'll see some changes on the margin. Overall, my personal expectation, if I'm looking at the economy as a whole, is that you'd see a very similar balance between amortized cost and fair value. And certainly from an ISB perspective, we didn't have more fair value or more amortized cost as an objective. The idea was simply to have a stronger rationale for why you choose one or the other. Moving to the matter of impairment. Uh, again, impairment fairly complex under I-39, different impairments for different classifications, etc. So that was one of the drivers for uh, reviewing the standard. So we have a new approach, which is quite different from what we have in the past. Could you just take us through the rationale and the steps involved in the new process? And in particular, whilst you're doing that, to give a particular view on how non-financial uh, institution businesses would potentially apply the new thinking. A couple of parts to that question. So let me start with 39 again, just talk to what 39 actually does. I-39 is what we call an incurred loss model. Incurred loss means that you actually have to wait for an objective indicator that a loss has happened before you can start to provide for those losses. Um, it does have what we call IBNR, incurred but not reported component to it. And IBNR allowed banks to a certain extent to anticipate the losses that they thought had been incurred, but they just hadn't found yet in their book. So there was an element of anticipation going in, but generally speaking, the way 39 worked is you waited until a loss event had actually happened and recognized it at that stage. The problem, and this is an unusual one, even for banks who are actually raising the provisions, and no bank likes provisions on its books, but even banks who are raising the provisions were very concerned with 39 that it led to providing too late in the cycle. Um, in essence, and the easiest way to understand it is to look at any of the banks reporting. What you will generally see is in the six months or the year before the bad debt start to show up, loan growth slows down. And the simple logic for that is in most circumstances, banks have identified a trend that has given rise to concern. They've started to close down the taps, but haven't yet closed them entirely. So they've slowed down their lending activity. Now that slowing down of lending activity implies knowledge about credit markets but that credit market knowledge could never be reported in provisioning under an incurred loss model. So that was 39. When we were addressing this, our key concern then was to see how we could address this fact that there was some knowledge there that wasn't actually being reported. And the way we've done it is to move from an incurred loss model to an expected loss model. Expected loss model says, let me anticipate what I believe the losses are going to be based on objective data. So you need information that is available like interest rates or household debt or house prices or job losses or GDP, those sorts of information that's out there. But that you, you can actually start to provide for an expected loss even before the actual loss has happened, even before you have it evidence that a particular loan has gone bad. That allows you to move the loss provisioning earlier in the cycle. Because of that, we've changed from the, I, the IS39 approach, which was you had a performing book and you've got a non-performing book, to an uh, IFRS 9, you have a performing, you have an underperforming, a book where your pricing for credit does not quite anticipate, doesn't cover the losses you expect to make, and then a non-performing book in a similar way to 39. The additional classification allows us to, or allows us to allow banks and other organizations to provide for losses earlier in the cycle to actually anticipate what's coming. Now in a bank environment, that's great. Banks keep a huge amount of data about their clients. They've got a lot of understanding about the drivers of bad debts with their clients. They use that information in pricing, so they're looking at that information well in advance. They have the data to be able to do this. 
As soon as you move outside of the banking sector, it becomes a lot more difficult. People don't keep that sort of data. And so what we've built into the standard is a lot of simplifications. If your um, exposures arise from trade finance, in other words, you actually have a revenue transaction, and this is simply about how you financed or helped the client finance their, their acquisition, then you start with IFRS 15, which refers to, you, to IFRS 9, and there's relief provided in those circumstances on an optional basis. You can choose the relief or not. If you have a situation where it's less than 12 months, the, the um, exposure period, then you actually require to go down the, the route of taking that relief. And we think the relief will make it a lot easier for companies to apply. They simply take an upfront day one loss, pretty much on the same basis that many of the companies have been doing it up to now, based on what their expected loss is over the period of, of the loans, based on whatever information they have available. Right, so I suppose for <coughs> trading businesses that will be a little bit of a change because it will take a, an, an upfront loss, whereas they would have previously had to wait for a, a, a loss event to take place or an indicator for a loss event to take place. As a general assessment of the impact, do you think that most businesses that are not in the financial or banking space are going to find the new standard easier to apply or a little bit more difficult to apply, just as a, as a general stance relative to our study? I certainly think that they're going to have to get more information than they have right now. They're going to have to look a little bit to their history, to what's actually happened in their books in the past. We have put an undue cost and effort type of clause in there that allows them or doesn't oblige them to go out and look beyond any reasonable expectation for information. So you look at the information that you have. The historic information I think that most companies have, and hopefully the information they consider before they advance credit in the first place, should give them a good basis to do this. And the simple thing is that they're perhaps going to be the simple addition, if you like, is they're going to be taking the information that they use in the credit granting process and then apply it in their accounting process going forward. Right. Moving on then to the ugly sister of uh, financial instrument accounting, which is hedge accounting. You know, notoriously small proportion of companies that are, are exposed to, to risks which they are actually managing and, and hedging in different ways have actually, under the old standard, elected to apply I-39 hedging rules. And presumably that was something that was in the back of your own minds when you were looking at the new standard as, as one factor. I suppose another factor would be the evolving environment around risk management and whether or not the, the existing standard was up to scratch with that. So as you take us through the overall approach to hedge accounting under IFRS 9, could you also comment on whether or not you think the new proposals will make it more likely that businesses that are in a position to apply hedge accounting will actually opt to do that and whether or not that's something the ISB has a view towards either being positive or, or for, for it or uh, fairly neutral uh, in, in their views? So 39 had a very rule-based approach to hedge accounting and in fact I think it's probably not unfair to say a very artificial approach to hedge accounting. Hedge accounting didn't necessarily reflect the activity you were trying to engage in and instead to an extent reflected your ability to try and take some volatility out of your income statement. And the result was that for many companies trying to apply 39 was onerous, it was an accounting exercise rather than a risk management exercise, it was very difficult to do, very difficult to get past your auditors, and it often had unintended consequences. You would do something on day one and then find you had to live with it on day two when circumstances had changed. The approach we've taken with IFRS 9 is to actually try and reflect the underlying business activity or comment about the risk management activity. By reflecting the underlying activity, what we're doing is we're actually changing the accounting to say this is something, the accounting now explains a business activity. It makes it a lot easier for a manager to stand up and explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. And the background work you have to do to achieve the accounting is a lot less. There's a lot less uh, documentation involved, a lot less artificiality, a lot less chartered accountants that you have to involve in the process. To the point of whether or not we think that this will result in more people using it, I think it plays into one interesting question. For many companies that have used hedge accounting, as have used hedge activities in the past, but not used hedge accounting, they've accepted and lived with the volatility on their income statement, and they found that they can now explain that volatility. That's given them a little bit of comfort. They, they're comfortable that they can now talk to it, they understand it. The users of their financial statements understand what the background to that is. It also suggests that it's probably not kind of earth-shattering amounts that are moving around in that space for those companies. I think for them, at least initially, a lot of them might decide to do nothing. 
not to adopt hedge accounting now because why add complication when everybody already understands where you are right now? I suspect what will happen over time though is that you'll have first time adopters, people who pick up in that particular industry and decide, well, hang on a second, this isn't as hard as it used to be. It does reflect the way we manage the business and it might be easier to explain if we use hedge accounting. I think as one adopter picks it up in a particular industry, it's going to put quite a lot of pressure on others to think about the same. You don't want to be the one who stands out in the industry. You want to be pretty much the same as the others. <clears throat> so my suspicion here is that the adoption of the hedge accounting, certainly in the non-financial institutions, will happen over a period of time as people pick up, as it becomes a flavor, as people become more comfortable with using it and understand how it works. I don't expect a big, a big bang approach where everybody suddenly changes. From an ISB perspective, we made it optional because we do think that it does require some additional work. We do think that there is some merit in just putting it all out there and letting people understand what's happening and living with the volatility. So we're comfortable to leave it like that. A couple of years time we come back, we do a post implementation review, we'll probably take a view on how many people are using it. And at that point we may decide to make it mandatory. Speaking post implementation, well post implementation of the entire standard, uh, it's, it's become one of the things that the ISP of late has become, uh, you know, it's become a feature of, of what you do, which is to go back a few years after a new standard, uh, engage with preparers, users, uh, other people who are affected by new standards and say, how has this actually played out? Uh, is there anything we can learn and then to inform potentially changes to the standard? Are you preparing a, or planning to have a similar approach? with respect to FS9, and do you have any idea around timing? I suppose we need to first of all note that the effective date for this uh, new standard is financial periods commencing 1 January 2018. Correct. So some distance uh, in, in, in the future for now, but any plans at present around how you're going to do your post implementation process? So the principle that we've adopted from the ISP perspective is that we will now do PIRs, post implementation reviews, on all of our new standards as they come out, but that we'll give, we'll have a bidding in period of about two years. If you've got a bidding in period of two years, so that takes us to 2020 in this context. We then do a call for new information to understand what worked and what didn't work about it and so forth, which probably takes us another two or three years after that. So yes, we will have one, certainly unless something fairly significant changes in the way the process works at the ISB. But no, it's not likely to be any time soon. And it's certainly not going to affect people in the process they're busy with right now, which is the adoption and implementation of the standard. Um, also, what we've seen in the practices we've done, and we've done this already with IFRS 8, and we're in the process of doing it with IFRS 3, is although we get feedback on the standard, and although it's useful input, the types of changes we've tended to make have been quite small. We're not looking at making significant changes. Now, obviously, I'm now presupposing what the outcome might be, and we may, in fact, hear something that suggests we do need a significant change. But I'm not seeing this being a game changer in terms of the way the standard works. What's important in the context of IFRS 9 specifically is we do have a transition group that we put together. And the transition group and implementation and transition group is primarily about evaluating implementation issues as they come up during the process. Now we've only done it for the impairment area because that's the area we've heard the most concern about. And the idea is to just advise preparers as they adopt the standard on an ongoing basis. Now, out of that may come hopefully just guidance, perhaps some more examples, perhaps a little bit more of a basis about why we made a particular decision. But it is possible that there could be interpretations that come out of it or even changes to the standard during the next three years as people actually pick up and adopt the standard. Um, the invitation group, I think the announcement was made yesterday, and there is a South African representative on the group. So we as a country are there, and we'll hopefully get our voices heard about it as well. So as for me, the last point before thanking you is just to, to give you an opportunity maybe as, you know, it's, it's your product as an ISP, but I suppose it's our product as, as a financial reporting community, is, you know, it is available for early adoption. Um, now, if you had to, to make a pitch uh, to a company to say to them, these are three or four reasons why you need to think about early adopting this standard. You know, what would those three or four things be? That's a tough one. I think on the, on the, on the negative side, and I'll perhaps start with the negative side first before I discount that a little bit. On the negative side, adopting a standard early always has the risks that you're going out ahead of the pack, that you are taking interpretations that others might look at and say, well, oh, how did you get there? And we come up with a different answer and so forth. So I think you do have at the start a little bit of a negative around that. 
Um, you're also learning, you're on the bleeding edge, if you like, of technology, which I think is negative. On the positive side for me is the fact that um, these changes in IFRS 9 are things that people actually wanted. It will make the process easier in terms of applying the standard on an ongoing basis. It's a much closer reflection of the way companies actually do business. Particularly when I look at impairment and hedging, both of those are much easier to apply because they're much more realistic representations of the way measurements happen internally. So that tells me that actually the answer you're going to get from implementing the standard is an answer that better reflects your business and allows management to better explain what's happening. That said, I don't think people should think this is going to be easy. It's a big exercise and you're changing major systems. So I'd probably still be more inclined to advise people to make this change in those circumstances where, for example, you've just bought a new big subsidiary and you need to bring the subsidiary onto IFRS. Bring the subsidiary straight onto IFRS 9 and changing to IFRS 9 yourself, rather than the two-step of IFRS 9 and IS 39 may make more sense. If you're just implementing new systems, aligning those systems with IFRS 9 might make more sense. So I think they're, they're those sorts of rationale. I suspect personally, not too many people will early adopt. It will be specific circumstances when you early adopt. And that's both because of the fact that there's a lot of work involved and because I think people will be nervous about this early mover issue. Right. Well, Dal, thanks very much. Uh, very informative chat on the new standard on financial instrument reporting, which is IFRS 9. Thanks very much for, for chatting with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.